Often when reality comes, so does grief and loss. We're feeling lots of loss and grief these days. Sorrow is what I'm talking about here, which is the result of distress, and distress comes because of loss. Our grief is not only about COVID-19, it's about our political divisions and directions. It's about the state of our environment, the lack of health care, the loss of income and opportunity. It's about the loss of our way of life. This is not an exhaustive list. I wonder what you're grieving right now. Sometimes to make the grief bearable, we offer ourselves and one another denial or false assurances. In a world full of grief and loss brought very close in the 24 hour news cycle, we consciously or unconsciously give ourselves and one another permission to be numb and numbness shrinks our empathy. It dials down our compassion and it blunts how we authentically feel. We do this just to survive. But this numbness is a bottled up sense of grief and it can turn into scapegoating, it can turn into self-destructive behavior, it can even turn violent. But this numbness, it robs us of energy, innovation, perspective, and spiritual maturity. Without giving voice to grief and sorrow and loss, there's no energy to begin to hope. But Jesus has invited us to share in his life and he has given us reliable coordinates to this abundant life. We are the people who have an image of a murdered man, a lynched man hanging above our buildings and over our altars and even around our necks. There's a genius to this. Keeping the cross in front of us with all its shame and all its victory is the way we increase our spiritual and emotional capacity to process and even transform grief. We're the people who say regularly, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We're not the people who say, don't weep, don't show weakness, suck it up. We're the people who don't have to choose busyness substance abuse, or artful defenses to insulate ourselves from grief. We've got a friend in our grief. We're the people who know that more than half of life's best transformative lessons are taught through grief and loss. I'm talking here about the paradox and genius of the blues. Blues man B.B. King said, blues is a tonic for whatever ails you. I could play the blues and then not be blue anymore. So we should not insulate ourselves from the life lessons that will give us the very peace and sense of intimacy with God we say we want. We shouldn't shut God out from the area that God does God's best work. The truth is we should be experiencing a sense of grief and loss when loved ones die, when our politics disappoint, when our environment is wounded, when our health care doesn't reach every citizen and when our educational system leaves young people stranded. We should be feeling grief when our farmers die by suicide because the pressure is just too much or when hatred steals another life. The prophets came to their communities to say out loud, we've got a problem. And that problem should be causing us grief. And oh, by the way, those prophets would say, these problems, they grieve God too. This is why Jesus told his story about the Good Samaritan, not to shame people who stepped over the man in the ditch, but to give them a glimpse of God's grief when we step over our neighbor. Grief rattles, it destabilizes, and it rewrites the fairy tales we tell ourselves. Grief purifies our prayers and refines our actions. Grief helps us to talk about what is not sustainable. Grief refuses any cover-up. Grief acknowledges that we might be out of step with God and with our neighbor. Grief opens up a space to say, I'm sorry. And grief is a welcome mat for God's intervention. It's acknowledging grief that displaces numbness. And when numbness is displaced, we begin the journey towards wholeness, and the new expressions of life and neighborliness. Grief is a season without which life cannot be fully lived. The truth is, Jesus crying out on the cross, giving voice to his feelings of loss and grief, make his rising from the grave that much more triumphant.
Without authentic expressions of grief, we have not met the necessary precondition for hope to be born. I wonder what it would be like for churches to gather up from all of their members the things that they are grieving and develop some great litany of sorts. Getting it all out in the open, maybe for the first time, getting all the mucus coughed up so we can breathe again.